that each of us walks a unique path in life, a path that we actually chose for ourselves. Our spirit designed it out of necessity for growth and evolution. What is truly remarkable about each and every path is there is no way of knowing what or who might appear around the next turn or over the horizon of tomorrow. Yet the answers are there, as sure as the sun will rise with them. Our spiritual self knows, but our human form does not. It accepts that tomorrow's experiences are meant to be and have divine purpose for us. Everything is as it is meant to be. Okay, I could have written that. I totally could have written that, but I didn't. (laughs) I am reading from chapter 46 entitled A Love Letter from Tremors in the Universe, an amazing book I just read by author Robert Beatty, and he's here today on the podcast. I'm so grateful. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Happy Healthy You, I should say. I'm Connie Bowman, the host. And at 50 years old, Robert Beatty was in, as he says, the best shape of his life. But one day on the treadmill, he started experiencing symptoms that would eventually lead to a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. And Robert pretty much calls that a miracle. So we're going to talk to him about that because that's crazy and awesome. And as I said, he's the author of Tremors in the Universe, a remarkable book. Thank you, Robert, for coming on the podcast. Thank you, Connie. Thank you for having me. Oh my gosh, your book was so sweet. And it it touches so many uh, chords with me. My father has been diagnosed with Parkinson's and we've been dealing with symptoms. And yours actually, you had an early onset um, you're, yes. you're, you're young for, for many well, thank you. Parkinson's. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're the same age, so I have to say you're young. Right. So, um, do you want to talk about that, about that, the, the diagnosis and how that happened? Sure. Um, I was diagnosed at 52 with Parkinson's disease and I had been, as you mentioned, I had been leading up to a 50th birthday, wanted to get in the best shape of my life. So I started working out with a trainer. And uh, at the age of 50, I was in the best shape of my life. And then one day while running on the treadmill, um, things didn't feel right. I I felt as if I kept running that I was going to trip and fall on my face. And um, things just, I knew my body really, really well. And one thing led to another and the symptoms weren't going away. So I sought out the help of my doctor. But... um, being such an early age, he chalked it up to getting older and said, you're worrying too much. But again, I knew my body really well, and I decided to chase after it. And two years through the medical community of trying to get a diagnosis finally led me to a neurologist, and um, I was diagnosed. Uh, But what to me, that's where the miracle occurred, um, because as I sat there, an overwhelming sense of peace and, and tranquility came over me that said, you have this under control, and you can take care of this, mm-hmm. and it could have been much worse, and that was the attitude I left with, was, wow, this could have been so much worse. Um, The way I looked at it immediately, I had the opportunity to watch my children grow up. Uh, I knew I would probably have a good opportunity to see them get married and have children of their own. And um, that was most important to me because that is a big part of defining life. Um, There are so many other things that go on in our day-to-day lives that uh, if you don't let challenges overwhelm you, then... You, you still leave room and make space for the positive and to celebrate your life. Um, so I, my miracle was to have this sense that I needed to embrace the challenge right away. Um, I needed to give it purpose. And I believe that I'm, I'm the type of person that believes that the things that do happen in our lives are for purpose. Um, what we judge as good and bad is really subjective. Um, what I consider bad, the next person may think, that's fantastic, I would love to have it that way. Um, so I try not to get up, caught up into identifying things as good or bad, but simply as um, challenges or an experience I have to face 
And while I can't control those events that come into my life, I can control the experience with them. Mm -hmm. And that to me was key in this, in this situation of being diagnosed with Parkinson's was I had the opportunity right from the get-go to create and, and change my attitude as need be to best align Parkinson's with my life and still live a happy life. Yeah, uh, and that is a miracle if you can, that, that shift in attitude is, is what it's all about. I really want to dig into this with you. I can't wait to talk to you because sure. we have so much sure. in common. This is awesome. But I want to go back to that diagnosis just so people are clear. Uh, Parkinson's disease, as I've come to learn, has a multitude of possible symptoms. And I, I learned from your book so much. Um, if you have two or three of the the list that they they uh, talk about, then you are actually diagnosed. But, but, but there's a lot of different things that's kind of complicated to sure. diagnose, right? Sure. Um, there, are, there are four primary motor symptoms, which are the ones, as you mentioned, that uh, help them give a clinical diagnosis. Mm -hmm. But then there are also a number of um, smaller symptoms that show up. Um, there, for example, one of the main ones is tremor that you will see a lot with Parkinson's patients, but 30% of the patients don't have a tremor. Um, I myself do not presently have a tremor, um, but other symptoms are slowness of movement, loss of balance, uh, freezing where a patient actually will be walking along and then everything shuts down and the, their brain can't convince their, their motor function to move forward. Um, shortness of breath, uh, I mentioned loss of balance. Um, sleep uh, can be brutal for Parkinson's patients where your sleep patterns are off. Mm -hmm. um, mood, depression. Um, there are really a host, probably about 20 or 30 symptoms. And that is the other aspect that went into how I handled my diagnosis. And that was that the doctors really couldn't tell you other than you have Parkinson's, they can't tell you with any fact what symptoms you're going to experience right. and which ones you would not. So I chose from the beginning to assume the very best and until things change uh, to live my life uh, with all the abilities that I do have. Yeah, yeah. And you've taken such a, an inspiringly positive attitude. I want to share so many things about this book because I, I, I told you I read it on the plane as I was coming back from a vacation and I really couldn't stop reading it. It was so entertaining. And the title itself, Tremors in the Universe, you talk about your uh, affiliation, your, your work with the Michael J. Fox Foundation. And I love all the references to Back to the Future. For those who are too young to know the <laughs> Back to the Future, series I'm a big fan I you you obviously were too and yes. and Michael J Fox has done so much for oh, Parkinson's he's, research he's my idol mm, he's um, awesome we really couldn't have a better celebrity for Parkinson's mm, uh, truly it's that person that everyone feels like they went to high school with yeah and and talk about somebody who's really embraced what life has thrown upon him and really taken it to the highest level as have you so let's talk about you so how were you raised were you raised in a um, particularly religious or spiritual home i was raised in a very uh christian home okay my mom we were raised methodist and my mom was uh, adamant about taking me to sunday school every sunday yeah and i was baptized in the church i was confirmed within my church and I sang in the church choir, and I went on streets, so I, I, I did everything. Um, but I was at the same time a child that questioned. Mm -hmm. And I think for, a mom, for my mom and with her Christian background, I think it scared her mm -hmm. how many questions I did ask. Um, but that was coming from an intuitive part within myself. I, I've always been a very strong... Uh, had a very strong intuition, and I, f I don't leave questions a lot. I, I tend to bring them up. And uh, so I used to question my mom about our religion. And um, that questioning pushed me to actually expand my vision and my horizons of what I wanted to learn about not only religions but spirituality. 
and learning to follow what I felt in my heart and what I felt in my gut. And um, so I, um, the, how the relationship has progressed with my mom and I, uh, my mom is still alive, as is my father. My mom's uh, 80 years old now. Um, her viewpoint has opened up uh, dramatically to the point that she says that the experience I've gone through and, and everything I've discussed with her has broadened her scope of understanding. Um, and it's brought the two of us, it's really interesting how it's brought us together even closer in that regard. You're shaking things up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I can say that because you joke about it a lot in this yes. book. So, so. So, um, yeah, yeah, I get that, too. I was raised pretty generically Christian as well, Episcopalian, sung in the choir, same. Um, but I remember one day going to my dad and saying, you're not my father. <laughs> and he was like, what? You know, for uh, uh, my parents were raised in the 50s, so that was a huge, like, don't ever say that. And I'm like, no, God's my father, you know. And uh, I so we, I was always trying to, you know, take things to the edge and sure. ask the questions. And um, I actually had an experience when uh, my six-year-old Megan died. I wrote about it in my book. Um, and I went to my priest, who was soon to be a bishop. So she was a big wig in the Episcopal Church. I said, look, my three-year-old wants to know where her sister is, and she wants to know where heaven, where is heaven? Because I keep saying she's in heaven. I don't know what to tell her. Where the hell is heaven? <laughs> and, um, you know, she, she kind of gave me an answer that wasn't satisfying to me. Not, you know, I'm not saying anything bad about her, because she was beautiful and wonderful, but... Um, I just needed to know where she was. So that's that sort of took me on on my little path. But you mentioned in the book that one of the things that got you sort of started was the book by Richard Bach, Richard Bach, right? Illusions. Yes. Um, me too. And I want to just give a shout out to my friend Tom who gave me that book. It's funny how when you get a book from and someone. I remember exactly who gave me that book oh, as well. Shout out. Give a shout out. Patrick. Patrick. Patrick and Tom. You guys are awesome. It's funny because it changed, it shifted something in yeah. me, that book. Absolutely. Yeah, so he was the author of Jonathan Living. I, I Living love Seattle. those relationships with those people mm -hmm. in the sense that those are, again, intuitive people who, in my case, I remember vividly Patrick coming to me with that book and saying, you need to read this. Yeah. This is going to touch you. And there was that connection right then that he knew what was going on inside me enough to read something and go, this is perfect for this person. Mm -hmm. um, I love that. I love the, when that connection happens between people. And because you're connecting with their energy, you're understanding their energy and what their soul is about and what their spirit is about. And to me, there's nothing greater in life than connecting with people on that level. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember what it was about that book that, that touched you? Well, I, at the time, was heading off to become a pilot, and in that book, he's a, he's a pilot as well. Um, but um, I liked, I, I seem to recall, and I haven't read it in a long time. I haven't either. I'm kind of trying to recall, yeah. That there were, like, um, little reading points, um, maybe like a two-sentence parable, that appeared every so often in the book, almost that you could open it to pages and just catch one. Um, and I like the thoughts. I like things reduced down into very deep, um, inquisitive thoughts because I was the questioning person. So I like being made to think. And I, I appreciate everyone's um, viewpoints. And I write about that in my book as well, but that I'm again, so fascinated by when people can be open to share and um, be willing to listen, um, then you can really grow. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was, I, I think I was just caught by um, illusions, how it had, it opened me up to thinking. Yeah. Um, it was the first chance to kind of get out of my head and realize other people's heads were, have those same types of thoughts going on in them. Yeah, so, yeah, and at a young age, that's that's kind of you're coming into that spiritualism. Totally.
Totally. I, I agree. And I, I can't remember all the details either, but it makes me want to read it again. But yeah. I, and I remember it did shift something for me. Um, I want to talk about your diagnosis and the relief that you you uh, sensed. What do you think that was all about? I mean, for a while you had you knew that there was something like you said, you were very in tune with your body. What was that all about when that wave of whatever that relief or that sense of calm that that that's so well it actually was hard to understand mm -hmm. um and it really was the strong reason behind my i started writing a blog which event eventually ended up being the book but that writing was for the purpose of trying to understand this because it it was strange to me i kept even as a child, I again the inquisitive side of my brain always used to play and imagine and, and give scenarios for my life while other kids are imagining the scenario of the last seven seconds of a basketball game and they're making the shot. I'm imagining things about life of what if, what if, what if. And one was I always remembered seeing other people getting diagnosis of cancer or something. And I used to think, I wonder how I will react if I ever have a diagnosis given to me that way. Would I be lost? Would I, you know, go into a depression? How would I, how do I think I would react? And I even remember at that young age thinking, I think I would want to set an example. I would want to, you know... Um, struggle through it if need be, but uh, that I would get through. And um, so when the diagnosis came of Parkinson's, um, as I said, it was a, such an overwhelming sense of calm that I felt comfortable that I could handle it. I was most worried about my wife and my children, mm -hmm. um, about being a burden to them. I figured any burden I am to myself, I can handle um, but what it, how I would be impacting their lives was of concern to me. And especially with Parkinson's that you don't know how it's going to progress. And they, they can't give you really a good picture of how it's going to be for you. Then again, you're left with your imagination. And, um, and you've got a good one. <laughs> well, I, and I, and I, and I talk about that extensively mm -hmm. because, um, as human beings, if we've never experienced anything or something in particular before, when it happens, we have no choice but to only go by observations of everything we see around us. So for Parkinson's, it's every Parkinson's patient you've ever known. And if you don't know them, then you look things up on the Internet. And when you look things up on the Internet, yeah. They give you the worst. And so the brain is immediately left to simply imagine the worst. But that's a choice. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where, for me, it became I wanted control over Parkinson's. And the control I could take was choosing how I wanted to imagine this playing out. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I chose to imagine that my life is not going to change regardless of Parkinson's. The, granted, I'm only four years down the road right now, but um, I go into my doctor's appointments and they keep saying, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. Because you're doing great. And um, I just smile and say, that's what I'm doing. I'm smiling. I'm doing great. I'm doing I'm great. I'm my way through it. What do you know at this juncture about the uh, the connection of having a positive attitude and healing? Um, well, I've actually followed that in a personal route now to become a shaman myself, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe I, define I, shaman before we go on. Define shaman. Um, a shaman is a person that believes strongly in the connectedness of all of God's creations um, and that there is spiritual energy in everything that is available for our healing. Well, heck, then that makes me a shaman. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it really does. I haven't had any training. And, and the other aspect of a shaman is they're really kind of nicknamed wounded healers mm -hmm. because they are individuals who first have to go in and 
face their own shadows and do their own healings. Mm -hmm. um, and when we talk about healing, uh, it's not necessarily entirely on the physical level, like thinking of uh, the Parkinson's symptoms, but really at a much deeper level, at the spiritual level, that wellness truly comes from within your heart and within your mind and how you feel about yourself. Um, and I do believe there is a connection between um, bringing that attitude and bringing that awareness and bringing in the power of spirit on your behalf that can make a difference in people's outcomes. And I would be hard-pressed to find any Western medical doctor who would say, oh, don't put a positive attitude towards helping yourself out. Um, it, they need more of that. And we, we attend to the mind and the body very well, but we leave out the spirit quite a bit in terms of physical wellness, in terms of the wellness of our, our whole. Now, so. during the course of this journey for you, it's like you mentioned it had been four years, when did the spiritual aspect really come in strongly for you? And when did you start using it as a, a, a way to bring your body, mind, and spirit back into balance? Um, I started employing it right off, right away, okay. um, immediately after diagnosis because, um, I started a regimen of exercise and I haven't been a devoted meditator in the past, mm -hmm. but I started meditating much more. Um, and I found that the exercise time that I devoted to myself in the morning was a great time to meditate and the other, uh, aspect that I brought in was always giving gratitude. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have a chapter in my book called Attitude and Gratitude. And every day I start out with not only thanking for the day that I do have and all the things that I have, but I also give thanks for everything that's coming to me. Because I believe that by setting an expectation of good and, and wonderful things coming into your life, then with that sense of anticipation, it elevates your mood, it elevates your attitude, and it only helps in terms of everything else you're dealing with in terms of challenges. Um, so that aspect, interweaving that spiritual aspect, um, came in early on. But even prior to that, I had started doing um, work with a massage therapist who's also a spiritual healer and en energy healer. She was a gift. Um, I, what you wrote about her and what a, oh, I mean. She's, yeah. She is. And a shout out. Stacy yeah. Page Owen. Hey, Stacy. Fantastic, fantastic, life-changing yeah. woman. And I actually thought you two may would have met at some time in the past maybe we will we so will. and and we should also say massage is is really a good modality for parkinson's yes maybe you could talk about that just a minute I don't Absolutely. Lose, i'm going to write down what i want to talk about but sure. massage and some of these alternative uh, modalities are really excellent so absolutely um, go while i save my thought <laughs> because and I'll even expand on that a little bit because um another thought is i found that stress can be one of the greatest uh, factors to how symptoms play out for Parkinson's patients. It can ex exacerbate symptoms quite dramatically when stress is up. Um, massage therapy and exercise are great for alleviating stress. Um, so, but back to the spiritual aspect, the work that I've done with Stacy has been instrumental in terms of uh, coaching me um, and helping give me guidance. It led me to the shamanic program. Um, and uh, the whole well rounded package has just been phenomenal in terms of uh, drawing strength from, from my spiritual beliefs. Mm -hmm. And from something out, out there. The reason I ask that question is in my experience and after talking to so many people, um, it seems as though when we as humans are hit with something unexpected or not necessarily anything, a death, a disease, a diagnosis, a divorce, um, there is a certain amount of resistance that we put up and we have to reach a point of acceptance before any true healing or coming reconnection to ourselves can happen. And it doesn't sound like you went through any kind of... Uh, uh, 
any of that resistance where you actually had to surrender? I mean, it seems like you were um, so prepared. But surprisingly, through the shamanic program, which, again, we had to do our own healings, which it was perfect for me because it allowed me to now look at this mm -hmm. under a microscope, to per se. Um, and that's what the shamanic type of healing is. You look into the your subconscious and your dark areas to face your fears and your shadows that for a long time we bury. We just stuff them down and say, I'll, I'll put a smile on my face and I'll, I'll deal happily with everything. And that I discovered in that one of my healings was um, facing the fear of failure, um, fearing that I could fail at fighting Parkinson's, uh, failing at writing a book, failing at owning my business for the past 27 years, failing as a father, failing as a spouse. Um, I have a high drive to succeed, and a lot of people would look at that as, that's great, that's great, that's great. But when I faced the true idea of what I would, how I would feel if I failed, there was a lot of energy behind that, and a lot of energy I was storing away. And... I needed to come to an understanding that if I failed, I was still loved, and my family would love me, my community would love me, my friends would love me, God would love me, that there was, there was no loss if I failed. And by facing that shadow and coming to that understanding, I was able to let that go. Mm -hmm. And so there are, there are things that... Even if we succeed at um, facing challenges real strongly, that um, you still need to be true to yourself and, and really look at every possible message you may be carrying. Um, I want to go back to that first par that paragraph that I read from your chapter entitled A Love Letter, where you say that my personal belief is that each of us uh, I don't have my glasses on, so I can't really read this small print. Walks a unique, new, unique path in life, a path that we actually chose for ourselves. Do you really believe that we came into these lives and chose to, from in my experience, lose a child, lose that sweet daughter, and you to go through this kind of suffering? Um, yes. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. Um, that was a setup. So expound and, upon and that, please. To... A reluctant so Messiah. A story, that I, a story that I told in the book um, is the one that, that really rings true to me for this, this question. And that is, when I was 30 years old, um, I was coming out of a grocery store, and there was a small flyer on the wall for a little five-year-old girl who had leukemia, and her family was looking for a donor uh, match for uh, marrow. And... I could have passed that by, um, but I picked up that little tab off that paper and I went two weeks later and gave blood for the little girl. Um, I was asked by the bone marrow registry if I would like to um, be listed on their registry and I said sure and pretty much forgot all about it. Um, about 10 years went by, or five years, I'm sorry, five years went by. And I finally received a letter saying I was a possible match um, for another patient, a 53-year-old patient in Austria. And went through six weeks of tests to determine that I was an absolute match. And then was asked, would I give the donation for this man in Austria? And I said, absolutely. How I couldn't understand how anyone could ever pass up an opportunity like that. Um, but the day off of doing all the donations, the nurses and everyone around were thanking me over and over and over for what I was doing. And I said at that time, and it'll probably, it always brings it right back up for me. But I said, um, I didn't do this. Um, a five-year-old girl who gave her life um, made this possible for this man. Um, the grief that 
those parents felt over the loss of their five-year-old daughter um, has to be immense. And for them to try and find purpose in that, um, I see the purpose on the backside, and I'm just one person. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe there are multitudes of levels of impact that that five-year-old girl made and that every life makes. Um, It's unfortunately not ours or not our opportunity to know right now. Um, But I believe and I trust and I have faith that there is an answer for everything that happens. It's all just a big interwoven tapestry, isn't it? Yeah. 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 I I remember reading that part uh, in the book as I was flying. I was sitting next to people and I'm like wiping tears away. (laughs) Like, oh, gosh, that was so sweet. Yeah. And I do. I believe the same thing. I mean, we are given an opportunity to help when we don't know what the ripple effect will be. So, right, right. Yeah. absolutely. What do you feel Parkinson's is here to teach you? Um, I don't know if it per se was, I haven't come to the conclusion that it had to be Parkinson's. Yeah, probably um, could have been anything, yeah. That's probably I, true. I, but I, I do, um, it, it it has impacted my life in so many, so many fantastic ways. I mean, I've, I've been introduced by the um, chairman of the board for the National Parkinson Foundation at a luncheon to talk, and he said, the first time I met this guy, he said, Light, Parkinson's changed his life for the better. And I thought he was crazy. And But it, it is so true that the things that have come about um, have been amazing. I never, never would have anticipated I'd write a book in my life. Um, I never anticipated that I would be given the opportunity to give a TED Talk. Mm, um, that's cool. And it, it, it allowed me to teach my children. Um, aspects about life and and experiences, things we have to experience that wouldn't have happened. Um, It changed my mom's life. It changed my my parents' life. Um, The impact just in my network has been tremendous. Um, Then it allowed me to, my family became involved in fundraising for Parkinson's. We've raised about fifty thousand dollars just um, through friends and and our our events and and charity things that we do. Um, and it opened up my spirituality and it connected me to God that much more um, and connected me to myself. And that feels wonderful. Mm. That feels fantastic. That's beautiful. Yeah, and the ripple effect. So you must have, you mentioned you're primarily asymptomatic from the tremors. Um, But I'm sure, and you write about, you know, having off days. Do you have any advice or what what do you do for yourself to get you through some of those um, more challenging days? Well, I am a strong advocate for respect what your body is telling you Mm -hmm. Um, because... There are bad days. There are days that you just need to rest. And while it seems like it would be the great thing to just keep going and going and going, um, when your body's telling you certain things, there are days that I even believe spirit's telling you, yeah. hey, take it easy. Yeah. Just, you know, take a day off. Um, so definitely listen to your body. Um, the other is communication, I think, is extremely important for patients. Um, A lot of what I've learned is that a lot of Parkinson's patients do not like to talk about Parkinson's. Um, They feel it's a stigma. Mm -hmm. They feel people may think of them differently. Um, So, or they're ashamed. And um, so a lot of patients do not talk about it. A big part of the response that I got from my book was from spouses and children 
who would say, wow, I never really understood what my father or my mother was going through because they never spoke about it. Um, I ended up guilty of the same thing. I, I came out with such a great attitude right off the bat and assumed everybody then had a good attitude about me having Parkinson's. I neglected to ask my wife how she felt about my Parkinson's. I just assumed if I put on the positive face, she'd mm-hmm. feel good. Right. Um, until one day I had said I received this wonderful response about the writing, how do you feel? And she said, she eventually confessed that she was more afraid of my Parkinson's than I was and that she didn't know how to approach me about it because she didn't want to take away from my own strength. And um, that became very important to me for us to communicate better and that part of my purpose is to help her along. Um, and um, so communication is not just between the patient and the doctor, but the patient and the spouse, the patient and the family. And the other thing is that the patient isn't the only one suffering. Um, they're not the only person dealing with the symptoms. Um, but on the other levels of physical aspects of the disease, um, I use first thing when I get up in the morning to do an assessment. I kind of sit at the edge of the bed and just um, kind of do a once over about how I feel, if, if there's any weakness in my body, um, and then kind of plan the day out with medication, things like that, based on the needs of the day. Um, my primary symptoms are slowness of movement when I'm not on medications. Um, I have other issues with um, another symptom can be softness of voice. So as the day goes on, my voice will start giving out more and more. It's pretty common, right? Yeah. Yeah. And um, I'm a graphic designer by trade, so I work at the computer a lot. And for a lot of patients, it's handwriting can become very difficult because the hands become stiff. And for me, typing on a keyboard can become difficult at times. Um, so it's, it's really about managing um, your body and being attentive to its needs mm-hmm. and, and recognizing that there's sometimes you just have to take some time off and, mm-hmm. and, and rest. And as a shaman, do you recognize, well, now that I'm a shaman too, <laughs> do you <laughs> recognize that those may be the times when spirit's trying to get your attention? Maybe you hadn't been communing sure. enough. Absolutely, absolutely. And I... I approach things that way. I'm talking to my spirits all the time. Yeah. Um, giving thanks and and putting out my requests. Um, I do believe that the vibrations we put out into the universe, the energy we put uh, put out, call them prayers, call the energy, um, gets heard, mm-hmm. and it comes back to you. Um, oftentimes we're looking for it the way we want to picture it though and not necessarily open to how the universe is giving it back to us so that's another thing is i i try to be even more open to how i perceive things yeah yeah can you give an example of how that might show up in your life because i know for me it shows up um for example, I, st- I did a weekly podcast for three years, and it was just sort of a rebranding for my voiceover career, and um, I decided I had enough podcasts, and now I'm just going to do it when I find interesting people like you that I want to talk to, and try to make it more quality than quantity, because I, th- I was feeling that I was just, I was, uh, what do we call it, phoning it in sometimes, because I just wanted to get one put out there. Absolutely. So um, as I stopped doing my podcast, I said to God, the universe, um, I'm open to whatever wants to come in and boom, something came in. But it wasn't what I thought it was supposed to be. But I think it was what I was supposed to be doing. And I mean, I don't even need to tell you what it is. But um, sometimes I feel like that happens. It's it's um, and then once I started playing with it, like oh this is awesome i could really go down this path you know thank you to realize how things can start to take shape Mm -hmm. that way -hmm. um i play with it at times with time um when i'm leaving somewhere and i don't think i've got enough time to get there on time then i start talking to spirits and we play with 
literally, you know, mm-hmm. if you can open up some lights and or make the time work out. And I've had times where it seemed like there was no way I should have gotten there. Me too. Uh, you pull up cool? on time and you're yeah. like, yes. How about and, parking and places? The simple little things like pulling around in the parking lot at a grocery mm-hmm. store, you know, the next aisle, there's going to be one up front waiting for you, a little mm-hmm. spot up front to park in and, and turn the corner and sure enough. <laughs> yeah. Life is really magical when we allow it to be and... And, and looking at, at your smile right now, just when we're talking about this, to me, that is the joy of life and spirituality. When you can connect in with that, mm-hmm. the smile comes, the happiness comes, the energy comes. And that, mm-hmm. to me, is what it's all about. Yeah. And we are supposed to connect with each other. Jesus said that whenever two or more are gathered, we... We yep. make the magic happen, so we need to continue to connect. Um, I want to go back to the caregivers because I, I felt like you hit on a really good subject. For someone who is a caregiver of uh, a patient with Parkinson's or a human being with the Parkinson's diagnosis, do you have any suggestions for communication with them um, to keep those lines open and how how to be there for them in a... In a Mm, what's the word in a true and loving in the most loving way really sure um well i've i've observed various patients and their interactions with their caregivers um and the hardest part is just remembering what each person is going through Mm. um because the patience of the Parkinson's patient is going to fluctuate as dramatically as their symptoms are. Mm -hmm. Um, They can have a specific symptom, and that symptom can be very mild on one day and very severe on the next. Um, So mood that the patient goes in is going to be up and down. But likewise, the caregiver um, has a lot of stress put on their life. Um, They need time. They need recuperation time. If they have friends that can come and relieve them for an hour, for two hours, um, that can be a godsend to a caregiver. Mm -hmm. Um, But as far as um, direct communication, um, from what I've seen, unfortunately, that's a quality of the relationship that gets established with the two people. Um, There are support lines that can help. Good point. Um, National Parkinson's Foundation and the Michael J. Fox Foundation both have great support lines that are fantastic resources for caregivers to turn to if they need help. Okay, that's Um, a good point. Yeah, and just the idea of having compassion, I mean, that's a good message for all of us. Everyone is going through something. Everyone, not one person doesn't have a challenge in their life. So just having compassion. Let's give everybody some hope. What's the latest on the research? I know you're involved in some different research. Um, everything continues to move along at a one at a, actually at a, a much faster pace now. Um, there's a lot of studies being done right now over in Europe. Unfortunately, the uh, the track for the fast track for medicines is a little quicker over in Europe than it is in the U.S. But there are some uh, promising developments on the horizon, um, drugs that are showing promise for not only slowing down uh, the progression of the disease, but some actually showing a complete stopping of, of uh, progression of the disease, now getting it to where they've even had drugs that are showing reversal that wow. eliminate, and the person's symptoms come completely back, but when they're taken off the drug, the symptoms immediately come back, so the underlying problem still remains. Um, and again, unfortunately, it's a cancer drug that has a skyrocketed price right now, and it's it's not feasible yet to to get for the um, whole community. But on the upside, um, exercise is showing dramatic benefits for Parkinson's patients. Um, I'm involved in a program called Moving Day here in Chicago, and it's actually nationwide, which emphasizes exercise for Parkinson's patients. And there are 
um, boxing programs that have become very popular uh, for Parkinson's patients. And they're all showing uh, to slow the progression of the disease, mm -hmm. which for right now, while research is still being done, that's the most important thing a patient can do. Yes. I'm a um, yoga teacher, yoga, yoga yeah. for Parkinson's. Yeah. Real good for balance, especially balance and um, just the mindfulness, mm -hmm. I, think, I think also is, right. is a yoga yoga thing. Awesome. Thank you so much for this. Thank this is you, just Bonnie. such an enlightening conversation. I have a feeling we could go on for a really yes. long time and probably bore a lot of people, but <laughs> I can talk about spiritual stuff forever. So thank you so much. So the book, again, Tremors in the Universe. It's great for everybody. I mean, there's so many good lessons here uh, in addition to your journey through this diagnosis. So thank you for that. Where can people find you. more about you, your TED Talk, yes. uh, hearing you speak? I know you're available to speak. Yes. So um, You can visit my website at www.tremorsintheuniverse.com. Cool. Very and cool. the book is also, it's available there. It's available on Amazon. So... Uh, it's a good read, and um, I would say even, and I'm sure you could see from reading it, you can even pull out Parkinson's and plug in any challenge you want in totally. life, and it's really, that's what it's talking about and addressing. Yeah. So um, that, there, that you can approach your challenges with a positive mindset, and it can make a world of difference for you. Beautiful. Well, in yoga, we say goodbye with namaste, the divine in me salutes the divine in you. How do you shamans, how do we shamans say goodbye? Uh -huh. Aho. Aho. Yes. Do we do anything? No. Oh. Aho. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. Awesome. Thank you, Connie. Bye-bye. Back to Happy, A Journey of Hope, Healing, and Waking Up is a small but powerful book about healing from one of life's greatest tragedies, the loss of a child. It's about love and sadness and being human. The nine lessons in Back to Happy are intended to be food for a broken but awakening soul. Healing from grief and loss is possible. Finding joy again is possible. Back to Happy, in paperback, Kindle and audiobook at Amazon.com. For more information, visit backtohappybook.com.